today, with your permission, I would like to speak about the remote pilot. Uh, the subject is in fashion, and I will tell you why in a moment. Uh, first, let me present a family of sister companies, and then in a few minutes we will go to the breaking news, which is Amendment 175 to ICAO Annex 1, to the first annex to the Chicago Convention of 1944. And then we will try to explore together how we can implement this amendment. So I am the founder and one of the shareholders of EuroSC Italia, and we present ourselves as a qualified entity. Qualified entity means that we are an independent organization, independent from manufacturers, operators, and service providers, so our assessment can be neutral. And this idea that in aviation we need this sort of companies is not just my idea, is already enshrined in the European Regulation 216 of 2008, which is the regulation on which EASA is based. There, there is an article which says that authorities may use companies from the private sec sector for the over safety oversight activities, but these companies has to be indeed independent from manufacturers, operators, flight school, and others in order to be neutral as the authority. Uh, so if you want, we are in between industry and authorities to help them to maintain safety while also allowing industry to survive, of course. In uh, IKEA, the term is not explicitly used today, today, but we are discussing. Because not only for drones, but in general, in international civil aviation, most authorities do not have enough resources. So we may need to use resources from the private sector paid by applicants, not by taxpayers, and used to issue independent attestations. As I said, in Europe, we already have the term qualified entities. In the US, they have the equivalent, which they call ODA, Organization Designation Authorization. And also in Australia, they have something. We discussed the matter, and we concluded that these entities are already covered by ICAO Annex 19. There is no need to change the annexes. In few years, ICAO may develop additional materials on the, what they call GASOS, Global Aviation Safety Oversight System, and probably in these manuals you will see more on the qualified entities. And so in this moment, I said we, have a, we are a family of four companies. One is in Brussels, Benelux, my friend Michel Mas. Another one is in Spain, my other friend uh, Manuel Ognate. And now we have a young sister in our family, which is Africa USC, and maybe that you already know the faces there in the bottom part of the picture. So let's go now to what's happening in ICAO, in Montreal. At the end of the ma March, ICAO issued a state letter informing to the states, the con 191 ICAO contracting states, that Amendment 175 to Annex 1 had been adopted. So the adoption is, of course, by the ICAO Council. The adoption was on last 9 of March. Uh, if you are familiar with the ICAO procedures, you know that once an amendment to an annex is adopted by the Council, does not yet mean that is uh, effective, that is really uh, approved, because member states, contracting states of ICAO, have three months to send a letter to ICAO and say, no, we don't like this. 
we reject this amendment. Should the majority of contracting states send this opposition letter, the amendment is deleted. In 70 years of ICAO history, it never happened. So it will not happen even this time, but still we have to wait. The amendment will become effective in July this year, and then the council has decided that it will be applicable at the beginning of November 2022. This means that from July this year onwards, until 2022, states may decide to implement, to transpose this amendment into the national rules, but they are not obliged. On the contrary, in November 2022, the amendment becomes mandatory. This amendment introduces the remote pilot license. RPL, to support international operations under instrument flight rules. Already the name, if you want, is something new because this person is not an operator. The operator is the employer, is the company. The person is a pilot, but the pilot is not inside the fuselage. He's on the ground, he's remote. We all know this in the world of drones, but for the rest of the community, for the rest of aviators, imagine that the captain is not in the aircraft, was a psychological trauma, which they had to digest. And of course, putting the cockpit on the ground, it's a radical change from the tradition. Of course, before adopting the amendment, there was a consultation of the member states on the draft. It was a success because Almost 60 states responded to the consultation, and so the Air Navigation Commission was able to consolidate the proposal. So once we look at the remote pilot and the drones, we should convince ourselves that we have to look into the future, not to the past. And I like very much this picture, because you remember that at the beginning of 1800, the time of Napoleon of the French Revolution, in some cities there were already omnibus carrying passengers, like the bus that you have today, but they were pulled by horses. Meanwhile, meanwhile the British, had, Mr. Watt in particular, had invented the steam engine. And one day, one engineer Mr. Brantons, a British engineer in 1813, had a good idea of putting the steam engine on a carriage with wheel and under rails. This was the idea of the train. But he had in mind the horse, not the future. And the steam power was not applied to the wheels. It was applied to this mechanism, which you can imagine they reproduced the aft leg of the horses. We know that it was not a good idea. And now trains look totally different. So once we look at remote pilot and drones, try to look at something which is new, not with the ideas of the past. And so even for the pilots, we started 100 years ago with the First World War, the Red Baron and other aces of the war making aerobacy and trying to shoot each other. Today, we still have in the largest part of the fleet, the captain on the left in the cockpit. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the person will be sitting surrounded by a number of screens, more or less like today, a flight simulator. The difference is that today, if the pilot moves the joystick in the simulator, there are actuators giving a feeling of the acceleration. In the case of the drone, the cockpit does not move. So the pilot does not feel any acceleration. The machine feels the acceleration. The acceleration. So if she or he pulls too many Gs, he will lose the machine. But the sensorial perception is totally different. And of course, to transmit the command from the cockpit on the ground to the aircraft, especially if we go to, to satellite, there is a certain latency which we have to take 
into account. But even more disruptive. Normally, the captain is prisoner inside the fuselage in the aircraft, which flies. Here, we may have drones we can stay in the air 24 hours or even longer. So during the flight, the captain may change. One captain may terminate air or his shift, walk away, and then over to another one. Totally different new situation, even from the liability point of view. And furthermore, the cockpits may not be only one. We may have cockpits in different locations. For instance, you may have a cargo drone from Johannesburg to Mumbai, and once the aircraft is approaching Mumbai, the responsibility for the flight could be handed over to a station in Mumbai. And this station may be managed by another company, not necessarily by the operator of the aircraft. And again, this is something which in Montreal, uh, the, our superiors in the Air Navigation Commission and in the Council are still frightening because it involves not only operational and technical issues, but even legal and liability issues. And we are still striving to put them together, everything. Anyway, we have this license in Annex 1 now. First thing, there is only one license. You know that normally we have private pilot license, PPL, commercial pilot license, CPL, with or without instrument rating, and airline transport pilot license, ATPL. For the drones, this is over. There is only one license, and this license from beginning is equivalent to CPL with the instrument rating, because flying under instrument rules with a drone is much easier than flying under visual rules. Totally opposite than the tradition of aviation. The uh, training would be completely competency-based, which means no minimum required number of hours, but demonstration that some competence has been achieved. Some colleagues will take 10 hours, others will take 100. But this means that we have not yet finished the work because to apply the competence-based training, we need to define precisely which are the learning objectives and how we assess them. So colleagues are still working in Montreal to implement this. And last but not least, that this license is unique. There is no longer private pilot license and commercial. There is one license. Whether a person uses the drone privately or corporate for his company, or whether the service is sold to someone else, is still the same license. So this distinction, which we have in our mind, commercial and non-commercial, with the drones disappears. We have the distinction, commercial and non-commercial, in the past, because general aviation may want to fly for fun or for their private purposes, and if we impose to them too heavy requirements, economically they could no longer fly. And since they risk their own life, we make these regulations less stringent. In the case of drones, there is no one on board. So why should we relax? The risk is for third parties in the air and on the ground. And even if the operation is private, we want the same standards of protection of the third parties. We don't care about the airframe. We care about mid-air collisions and people on the ground. So competence base require that we define all the learning objectives. And in this, there are colleagues working in ICAO in a new remote pilot license implementing implementation advisory group. So there will be more guidance material coming from ICAO, including in the second edition of the ARPAS manual, DOC 10019. Another point which may be important, 
no previous experience in manned aviation is required. Because aerodynamics, uh, propulsion, and rest, and feeling the acceleration is not felt necessary. So this remote pilot is a new professional. He has to be more conversant with computers, more able to reconstruct a situation, look at, at screens, if you want, like an air traffic controller. And so he's no longer the top gun which we are used to imagine in aviation. Then for the components of competence in the manual, we have listed three of them. One is to know theoretical knowledge, no wonder. We always had that for the pilots. The other one is practical skill, yes, of course, to know how, and this is also necessary, but, and this is quite novel, in 2015, we said that the remote pilot needs also to have an attitude which is commensurate with his job, to behave, to be. This means psychological stability. We have written this in 2015, before the German wings accident where the pilot committed suicide and was on board. And now, if you have seen the media since this day, it seems me that even the Malaysian accident of four years ago could have been a suicide, at least. This is what the, the media are saying. And before that, we already said, look, this person is on the ground, so does not risk error his own life. And so the psychological attitude is quite important. For the moment, this has not yet produced tangible effects, but maybe that in the long term, we will have something also to maintain the control of the psychological stability of these colleagues, because one may be perfectly fit at the beginning of the profession, but then diseases from the psychopathological point of view might emerge. Then, another revolution. Article 32 of the Chicago Convention says that the license to the pilot is issued by the state of registry. This is because the Chicago Convention and all the history which we have on the back was centered on the aircraft. When the aircraft is safe and the pilot is killed, everything is done. This was the thinking 70 years ago, 50 years ago. Today, today we have seen that 80 or even more of the catastrophic accidents are due to operational causes, not to technical problems. And so the emphasis is moving towards the operator. We are becoming operation-centric. And for the small drones, we more or less forget their worthiness. We don't care about their worthiness. We care about the third parties. So if you fly over the sea and you crash your aircraft, why should the authority bother? It's your problem. Anyway. <laughs> This is Article 32, the state of registry. We discussed with the lawyers in Montreal, does it apply to ARPAS? And they said, no, it does not apply because when it was drafted, this Article 32, our ancestors had in mind the pilot in the cockpit. So this is written in this document 10019. So Annex 1 may make reference to a state different from the state of registry. And indeed it does. Uh, the Council of ICAO, advised by the Air Navigation Commission, has decided that the license has to be issued or validated by the state of the operator. So the state of the company, where the company is established. So for a South African company in South Africa. But the famous ARPAS flying from uh, Johannesburg to Mumbai, the South African operator may decide to establish a station to land the aircraft in Mumbai. In this case, the license of the pilot working in Mumbai is still to be validated, if not issued, by South Africa. And in the case the South African operator contracts an Indian company to land the aircraft in Mumbai, still 
that license has to be validated by South Africa as the state of the operator. So the operator and the state of the operator become more prominent than the state of registry, which again is quite a change in the tradition of aviation. Uh, we have also in Annex 1 instructors, which of course need certain experience, and of course the instructor does not work as a freelance in isolation. He works in the frame of an approved training organization. And from November 2022, we need these approved training organizations. So how to implement? Uh, South Africa, like 50 countries around the world, is member of YARUS, Joint Authorities for Rulemaking on Amend Systems. YARUS has been working in parallel with uh, ICAO. Kirsty will correct me if I say something wrong, because you are more involved than me in working group one of YARUS. But there is a document which you may download free of charge from the YARUS website, which recommends how to transpose this amendment to Annex 1 of ICAO into your national legislation. Although there are few differences, first, in this document, the colleagues of YARUS said we will have a remote pilot license even for unmanned aircraft of less than 25 kilos, and even if flying only in visual line of sight. This is overtaken by events. It's too, too complex. We will not go that way, but it's still in the document. Instead, if you are above 25 kilos, now we would say in the certified category, there will be a rating for the aircraft type, but also a rating for the station type because we may have different types of station. Of course, if the crew is more than one person, you need a rating to operate in a multi-crew situation. You may have a number of other trainings and uh, endorsements, which you see on the slide. And the, uh, another noticeable difference is that flight examiners are included in the ARUS recommendation. ICAO never issued standards for examiners. This was left to the discretion of the states. But in each state, there should be rules on the examiners, and so YARUS is giving guidance on also for this. And as I said, the things which I would not recommend to follow is a license only for VLOS, which was the thinking when Yarus three years ago released this document, but there will be amendments in the future. So this amendment 175 to Annex 1, it's another portion of the iceberg emerging, but more is in the pipeline. We intend to revise Annex 2 on the rules of the air, at least to introduce, detect, and avoid. We need to uh, introduce, detect, and avoid, and the command and control link into an extent, and the ARPAS operator, the maintenance organizations involved, and the training organizations will go into Annex 19. Even more important, we will introduce a new product in Annex 8 airworthiness, where we will have remotely piloted aeroplanes, fixed wing, remotely piloted helicopters, but also remote pilot station. So the station would become a new aviation product. It may even have a type certificate, like the engine. And for me, this is also quite important we will have a new part four of Annex 6 on operation, international ARPAS operations. Whether commercial or non-commercial, same standards. And also, this would be the first time in history 
that ICAO will issue standards for aerial work. Until now, ICAO has never standardized aerial work by manned aircraft. This is left to individual states. In this new part four of Annex X, aerial work and transport, commercial or non-commercial, will be treated in the same way. These drafts should be available between 2021 and 2023 and being promulgated in 2024. You may say that's still a long way, but uh, there was a lot of work because we have touched few of the differences which drones bring into the community and these were psychological and cultural obstacles in the community, so it took time to discuss. But, but whatever ICAO publishes apply to remote piloted aircraft flying internationally under instrument flight rules. The world of the drones is much larger, the world of unmanned aircraft, because we have model aircraft and toy aircraft. Once the distinction was clear, nowadays it's difficult. If I fly a little Phantom by DJI, am I playing or am I doing professional photography work? Difficult to assess. Difficult to assess. Then we have what Ikeo calls small unmanned aircraft, below 25 kilos, for which the Ikeo standards would be disproportionate. So for this, there is no need to have a formal license issued by the authority. And in theory, you may have even large remotely piloted aircraft only flying domestically, to which ICAO standards do not apply. This is only theory, because in reality, all the states, once they transpose the ICAO standards, apply them both to domestic and international aviation. Otherwise, it would be a mess. And then industry is already progressing towards autonomous unmanned aircraft. And even these autonomous machines are out of scope of the standards which ICAO plans until 20. 24, 2025. So there are a lot of other activities which the states should regulate beyond, or if you want, below the ICAO standards. No wonder. Even today, we have a lot of gliders around, but there are no ICAO standards for the gliders. And we have also hot air balloons or a ship. You may say that these activities are marginal, but they are there. So with the drones, only a minor proportion of the activity would be subject to the ICAO standards, the rest below the ICAO scope with the rules possibly simpler. And that's why in Yarus we are trying to cover the entire spectrum. And what do we have in mind in Yarus? Three categories. One is low risk, EASA colleagues open category, Yarus category A, low risk as perceived by the society. So it's something which may change depending on accidents which happen around, depends on what is seen by society on the television. Category B, medium risk, and category Charlie certified. ICAO standards only apply to the last category. So in A and B, no formal pilot license, no formal certificate of worthiness, because we are going towards an operation-centric approach. So category A is the kite of Charlie Brown. Buy and fly. Go to the shop, purchase a drone, and fly. You can do whatever you want. It's like if I want to buy a big knife to cut Parma ham in my kitchen. In Italy, it's legal. I don't need any license, any permission. I can buy this knife. Then if one day I will use the knife to kill my mother-in-law, then probably <laughs> I will be brought in front of the court. But then the judge say, OK, the mother-in-law, we understand you. We make a, we make a discount. 
you will not be sentenced for life. So this is category A. Buy and fly, no paperwork with the CIA, but this does not mean that there are no rules. The CIA will have established limitations. We are tending to say that the vendor has to give an official notice of this limitation to the buyer. And so if you go beyond the limitations, you are liable. In the middle category, there is only one piece of paper. And this is between the authority and the operator, not the manufacturer of the aircraft. Again, the operator. Only in the ICAO certified categories, we have the approved training organization, approved maintenance organization, remote pilot license, type certificate, a long list of traditional aviation certificates. But the fact that we have no traditional certificate means that there is no control, no oversight. I feel no, because we never had in aviation the issue of regulating aircraft from 10 grams to 100 tons, from flying three minutes inside a room to flying three months at flight level 900. So we have to cover an, an enormous variety of operations and machines. And so we start in the open category, buy and fly. In most states, states this is below 250 grams. Play, do what you want. A drone of less than 250 grams is very unlikely to kill a person. It may, but the probability is very reduced. If you want to go a bit higher, we may have some requirements for the theoretical knowledge competence of the pilot. In Europe, as I say, online training and passing an online test to an approved organization. And in Europe, we also say that the vendor, the manufacturer, has to provide a declaration of conformity with certain industry standards. So voluntary standards by industry, but the manufacturer signing a declaration that they conform to these standards. Furthermore, society seems to have concerns not only for safety of legal drones, but even for privacy and for security. So we need registration. In the US and in several other states, there is the obligation to register above 250 grams. And once we will have also electronic identification, this means that the police may identify the drone and know who is the owner, who is the operator, which is their criminal record, and so on. So even in the open category, although there is no authorization, approval, or certification by the CAA, still there is some form of oversight. Then in the specific category, there might be different levels to fulfill the requirements. The easiest one, the authority publishes a standard scenario, for instance, flying over urban areas with a drone of less than four kilos for aerial filming. You need to have uh, a flight termination system. You need to train your pilot, whatever. And for this, a declaration signed by the operator could be enough. So only one paper. Declaration, once the receipt of the document is acknowledged by the CIA, the operator may fly. If the operator wants to do something more complex, a declaration backed by an authorization issued by the authority. And so the operator will have to wait a bit longer. If the operation is again more challenging, the application has to be backed by evidence provided by the operator. For instance, the operator declares, I have trained by my pilots. Okay, show us your system of initial and recurrent training, show us your records. Or, still in the specific category, assessment by an independent qualified entity. So whatever the operator says is filtered by an independent body before going to the CAA. So you see that between the kite of Charlie Brown and the certified ARPAS, which goes from Johannesburg to Mumbai, we have a graduation of solutions 
which are today the state of the art on one side to protect the society, but on the other side also to allow small and medium enterprises to survive and to enter the market. So thanks for your attention, and I hope I am in time. Am I? Thank you.